following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The seventeenth arcanum is called the Arcanum of Hope. Any spiritual aspirant, any religious minded person, always seeks to find their hope in God. to find in divinity the inspiration to overcome suffering. In the 17th Arcanum of the Tarot, we find the science which drives hope. In Gnosis, we understand that any virtue any divine attribute arises from works. Mere belief does not convey unto the mind, unto the heart, lasting consequence. Hope is not mere belief. Hope, like faith, is derived from experience. Belief is a mere vain concept, while faith is the direct experience of that which is real. In the same way, we know that hope is also born from direct experience. Depicted in the graphic of the 17th Arcanum is a beautiful woman who rests comfortably on top of the waters, who bears in her two outstretched hands two vials, one of gold and one of silver. Obviously, the the woman who appears without any veil is the revealed Isis, the Divine Mother, who appears in all her splendor, revealed and unclothed before the divine sight of the initiate. To the common man, she remains veiled, mysterious, invisible. And that's because true hope is not born in the heart of the common man. The 
common man has vain belief. The concept of hope, but not the experience of it. This unveiled vision of Isis, the Divine Mother, manifests in the consciousness of the one who knows the science of Venus, who knows how to unveil the mystery of the Divine Mother, whose mystery is only revealed to those who worship her in accordance with her laws. Venus is the Roman name for an ancient goddess. The Roman cult to Venus was derived from the Greek. related to Aphrodite. And the Greek, in turn, the Greek mysteries of Aphrodite were inherited and influenced by many other cultures. We find among the Babylonians Inanna, or Ishtar, rather, the goddess of love and fertility, and among the Sumerians, Inanna. The goddess of love, Venus, Aphrodite, is so named due to her great beauty, And in the early times, this name was bestowed upon a beautiful light that would appear in the sky at dawn. The Greeks called this morning star Phosphorus, or light bringer. which in Latin is called Lucifer. And the Greeks called this evening star Eosphorus. which means west. And when the time came that it was commonly recognized that these two manifestations, these two beautiful lights, were the same, were one planet. They began to call it Aphrodite. Subsequently, we've known it as Venus. But you can see that Venus, Aphrodite, is Lucifer, is the Christ, in other words, or the messenger or vehicle of the Christ, which heralds the arrival of the sun and announces its departure, the beginning and close of each day. Ovid, in his Metamorphosis, wrote, Brilliant in the dawn, Lucifer had mounted high, the star that wakes the world to work. This ancient poem also presents a great deal of initiatic wisdom. And when Ovid writes of Lucifer, he's writing of that influence, that star, the light, which stimulates humanity to work in the path. And that force is none other than Lucifer, the morning star, the light, whose feminine aspect is Aphrodite, 
the goddess of love. Venus, Aphrodite, is related to the day Friday. This is her sacred day. And among the Nordics, Venus, Aphrodite, was Freya, which is where we get the name Friday, Freya's day. The symbol of Venus her most ancient icon is a circle from which hangs a cross. And in this symbol we find profound symbolism. A gate or a doorway through which we can understand many things. Those who have some interest or familiarity with the Egyptian mysteries will recognize that this symbol of Venus is identical to the ubiquitous Egyptian Ankh, which amongst the ancient Egyptians was their most sacred symbol. This symbol consisted of more of a looped circle on the top of a Tao cross, or a cross, a capital letter T. And throughout Egyptian artwork, we find this sacred emblem, whose meaning always conveys life, immortality. When we analyze the components of this symbol, we find a very interesting form of symbolism. Firstly, it's been said in all the ancient mysteries that the goddess of love, the goddess of beauty, Venus Aphrodite, who inspires all creatures with their sexual impulse, she utilizes this mirror to observe herself. Her mirror is the symbol, this hand mirror, which the goddess grasps in order to see her own reflection. The circle, one of the most ancient symbols known to man, represents continuity, cycles, Eternity, perfection, the womb. The circle represents the monad, the spirit, God. We find in the Egyptian hieroglyphs a symbol which is sort of an elongated circle or an eye turned vertical. This is the hieroglyph Ru. Ru means door, gate, mouth, entryway. Ru The hieroglyph represents the birthplace in the sky from which the sun emerges. So you remember Venus, that beautiful planet, always appears in the sky at dawn and at dusk. Ru is the symbol of the doorway, the gate, the mouth, which the sun enters and exits.
The earliest symbol of this shape in the Egyptian hieroglyphs looks like a curled piece of rope or a noose. It's a looped piece of string, a piece of rope, which has one circle and the two ends cross each other. Here we find one of the earliest representations of the sacred Ankh, this beautiful symbol of Venus. But this symbol is not unique to Egypt. It can be seen in many of the ancient images of Shiva, the creator-destroyer of ancient Hinduism, that in one of his arms he holds a noose or a pasa. And the pasa that he bears in his hand is a loop of rope or string which when he grasps it with his very hand, with his finger pointing outwards and the noose loops upwards above his hand, he forms with his fingers the ankh. the sacred symbol of Venus, the doorway of the sun, the mouth through which the sun enters and exits. This symbol, then, has an ancient history. We understand from studying Gnosticism That the circle is the monad, is divinity, is God, is perfection, eternity, cycles of birth and death. The cross, as well, has an ancient history and many levels of meaning. We see in the cross two beams which are crossing one another. This represents the four elements. It also represents the crossing of man and woman, masculine and feminine. In the Egyptian mysteries, we we see, of course, that the Ankh is the circle on top of the cross which indicates the spirit or God controlling the four elements. Or the spirit or God dominating the connection between man and woman. This, of course, is the region of Venus, the goddess of love, who inspires in the hearts of men and women the attraction for the opposite sex, and who fills them with the capacity to love in the divine way. When we refer back to the Greek mysteries, we find a very interesting symbol related to the Divine Mother Venus. Everyone has seen the famous painting by Sandro Botticelli of the birth of Venus in which we see the naked goddess emerging from the sea, standing upon a beautiful seashell. It's important for us to realize where this symbolism comes from and what it means. Firstly, we have to understand the name Aphrodite. The name Aphrodite is derived from her birth. Aphros is related to the foam of the sea. When the god Kronos took his scythe and castrated his heavenly father, He took the removed genitals and cast them into the Divine Mother Ocean. 
And when the genitals of his father struck the waters, the waters foamed. And from the foam arose the beautiful perfection of Aphrodite. Thus her name means born of the foam of the sea. Here we see Venus arising from the sea upon a shell. And the Greek word for shell is tais. To spell it, you can spell it two ways. C-T-E-I-S or K-T-E-I-S. This is the Greek word for shell. It also is a Greek word for the feminine sexual organs. But this word is also used in architecture. Specifically, in masonry. The tais is a pedestal, a foundation, upon which is placed a pillar. Here we see the Tao cross. The pedestal, the foundation, the tais, topped by a phallus, a pillar. In ancient masonry, this was the symbolic representation of the connection of the lingam yoni, or the phallus and the uterus. And if you were to take this symbol and look down on it from above, you would see a circle with a dot in the middle. The circle is the dice, the feminine sexual principle. And within it is the dot, the masculine sexual principle. The same symbol can be seen when we understand that the dais represents the Divine Mother and that sexual presence, when this dot becomes a cross. And now we have the Celtic cross, or the cross within a circle, which represents the same thing as the Ankh, the crossing of man and woman within the environment of the Divine Mother. Or in other words, how nature is regenerated. Nature is regenerated through the sexual forces which act within the womb of the Divine Mother Nature. The cross is the source of life. It's the crossing of male and female. And when that cross is active, when it's inflamed, when it's energized, that cross spins and becomes the swastika. That ancient symbol, ubiquitous across the face of the earth and present in every culture. There are actually two stories which explain the birth of Venus, the birth of Aphrodite. The first is that she's born when Kronos, in other words, Saturn, performs a circumcision with his scythe, his will. And those sexual masculine forces are combined with the sacred waters of the Divine Mother Ocean, the sea. And from that chaste union, the foam of the waters are churned. And emerging from those waters is the Divine Mother Aphrodite, Venus. Incidentally, Lakshmi from India is born in the same way. When the waters of the ocean are churned, she is born when a lotus appears upon those waters. 
The alternate version of the birth of Aphrodite is told by Homer. Homer explains that Aphrodite is born as a daughter of Zeus and Dion. In this case, this version of Aphrodite is Aphrodite pandemos, or the common Aphrodite. This is the inferior aspect. This is the Aphrodite that is concerned with physical satisfaction of animal sensation, animal desire. This impure Aphrodite is considered to be in direct opposition to the heavenly one. This is why we see in the graphic of the Arcanum 17 two triangles in the waters. One which is white, which points upwards. This is Aphrodite Urania, the pure heavenly goddess of love who exists within the waters of Yasad, the sexual force. The black triangle pointing downwards is the domain of Lilith, Aphrodite Pandemos, Sophia, the fallen Sophia, who is Sophia Prunikos. So we find then a great duality in the forces of Aphrodite, or the goddess of love. These two rival aspects are summarized and best understood when we analyze our own inner tendencies. In the case of a woman, we can find that a woman has the capacity for different kinds of love. Pure love and impure love. The pure love that a woman naturally has towards a child is a love that is natural, beautiful, and unconditioned at least in its root. This, we could say, is an example, a materialistic, superficial example, of what is called pure love, or chaste love. But within that same woman will also be the love of attachment. And even that same child, which the mother can love so purely, that love can become the love of attachment. And that mother can become attached to the child. So we see this potential for love to change shape. For love to change direction. The one who bestows upon the psyche The capacity to love is Venus Aphrodite, our own inner divine mother. She does this for our own good. For love is the essence of God. The spiritual aspirant, the seeker, truly is seeking to become one with that love. But in order to arrive at that perfection, that love has to be comprehended and made real, made spontaneous. In other words, for that love to manifest, the impure love must be removed. So then we have two forms of love to analyze and comprehend within ourselves. Conscious love.
which is the love of non-attachment, which is just the simple, pure love of which the book of Second Corinthians speaks. When Paul writes that love does not seek its own, This is the love of chastity, a pure love, unblemished with desire. Every great master, every great prophet embodies and represents conscious love. The great master, Jesus, beautifully exemplified all of the characteristics of conscious love in his gentleness and in his ferocity. We find the same beautiful exemplary behaviors in the Master Moses, in Buddha, in Quetzalcoatl, The path that all of these great prophets taught was the path to comprehend and realize the nature of conscious love. In order to do that, we need to understand the second type, which is the love of passion, the love of attachment, or in other words, conditioned love. This is the love that is filtered by desire. The love of a parent for a child has the potential to be pure. But generally, it is not. Because we are so absorbed within our desires, within our fears, within our hopes, our egotistical hopes, The type of love that a parent has for a child can become tyranny when the conditional love, the love of attachment, seeks to impress its will upon the child. The love between a man and a woman is the same. The potential exists for that love to be pure, to be a love of non-attachment, to be a love of chastity. But generally speaking, it is not. And this is because the ego gets involved with its pride, its lust, its fear. The ego wants to feel safe. The ego wants to be in control. The ego wants guarantees, proofs, promises, And so this love can become tyranny. In other words, it becomes impure love, which belongs to the klipop. Love in these forms has to be understood within our own behaviors, within our own mind. What are we attracted to? What draws our attention? What draws out of us what we think is love? When we experience something that we call love, is it conditional? Is it something we experience and enjoy because it makes us feel good? Because it makes us look good? because it makes us feel safe. Because it makes us feel important, successful. Pure love does not seek its own. 
Pure love does not seek to feed itself with sensation, with possessions, with anything. Desire is the great corrupter. Aphrodite is known to be the bestower of sexual virility, sexual attraction. She's the one who draws men and women together. But when she is impure, in other words, corrupted by the desires of our own mind, she becomes Lilith. She becomes Nahima. She becomes that fallen goddess who tempts, who seduces, who causes disharmony and discord. In the stories of the ancient gods and goddesses, we find many symbols of the seductive and destructive powers of Venus Aphrodite. We also find many stories of how she assists her children, her worshipers. So we need to understand this duality, impure love and pure love. These same qualities have to be examined within our own religion, within our own beliefs, within our own theories, within any doctrine which we study. In the East, these two points of view, these two forms of following the goddess of love are known as the left-hand path and the right-hand path. The walkers of the right-hand path are those who follow after the pure Aphrodite, the goddess of love, Lakshmi. The walkers of the right-hand path know that in order for them to acquire the boon, the gift, the grace of God, they must become pure. So they seek to purify themselves through the science of Venus. The walkers of the left hand, on the other hand, also work with the science of Venus, but the fallen Venus, the impure Venus, the Leith and Nahima. The walkers of the left-hand path embrace their desires and fulfill them. The term Tantra means the continuum It refers to the continual flow of energies illustrated in the circle of the sign of Venus. But tantrism has different forms. Black tantra is that form of tantrism within which the the practitioner utilizes desire to feed desire, to create more desire, to become enslaved by desire. In gray tantrism, the aspirant, the follower, occasionally satisfies a desire. And in white tantrism, the practitioner always seeks to renounce desire and conquer it. When we examine the vows that any student of tantrism will take, we discover the great differentiating factor between these schools of thought. (laughs) 
In the Tantra of the Himalaya, we know that the student who begins to study Tantrism, to enter into that method of work, will take a series of vows. The third vow of the series says to avoid sexual union with an unqualified person. In other words, to not commit adultery. The eighth says that the practitioner vows to never release the jasmine flower drops. What is that? To never release the flower drops. Firstly, we have to indicate we're studying the 17th arcanum. And we know in Kabbalah that numbers are very significant. And when you take the 17 and you add the 1 and the 7, you get 8. So the 17th arcanum relates with the 8th arcanum. And here in this 8th vow of white tantrism in the East, it says, never release the jasmine flower drops. In other words, do not orgasm. Do not release that sacred fuel. The flower is here on the head of Venus, the beautiful lotus, which always symbolizes Isis in Egypt, which always symbolizes Lakshmi in India, which always symbolizes Tara in Tibet. We see in the image of Tara She sits upon a lotus throne, surrounded by lotus flowers. That's because Tara is born from the lotus. The lotus flower, in the ancient Vedic scriptures, emerges from the navel of Vishnu, From his navel springs a beautiful lotus. And upon that lotus is born Lakshmi, the goddess of love. That lotus flower is clearly a symbol of feminine sexual potency. The flower with its beautiful petals opening resembles the feminine sexual organs and is a universal symbol for that. The lotus is a sacred flower in all the ancient mysteries. In the West, it's called a water lily. Every image of the Annunciation when the angel Gabriel appears to the Divine Mother Mary contains within it water lilies. Gabriel holds in his hand water lilies. The lotus. Gabriel is, of course, the angel related to the moon to the fecundating powers of nature, to procreation. This is why he always announces the birth of the child savior. The child savior, of course, is born of the lotus. Osiris and Horus in the ancient Egyptian mysteries, both related to the lotus flower. The great tantric master Padmasambhava has as his very name lotus born. Padma means lotus in Sanskrit. 
And in fact, Lakshmi is often called Padma, the lotus. So upon the head of our Divine Mother Venus, in this graphic, we see the lotus flower, the symbol of her sacred force. So the eighth vow of all tantric Buddhists who follow the white path is never release the flower drops. Those are the drops of pure essence, pure energy of the sexual forces. Why? The ninth vow also says to commit oneself to chaste behavior. The reason this is so emphasized in white tantrism is because this energy is the very essence of enlightenment. The flower drops are a coagulated form of energy which the practitioner has to cultivate and develop within oneself. In Mahayana Buddhism is introduced a beautiful term, bodhicitta. This is comprised of two Sanskrit roots, bodhi, which is wisdom, and citta, which is mind. The entire purpose of the greater vehicle of Buddhism, or the Mahayana, is the cultivation of bodhicitta. In the exoteric form, bodhicitta is explained to the layperson as the aspiration for the cultivation of compassion. In other words, love. The common Mahayana practitioner practices every day to cultivate conscious love for others. And this is through the repetition of various types of meditation practices and various types of vows that are taken. The more deep a student goes, the more is introduced about the nature of bodhicitta. The Mahayana practitioner who's advancing in their experiences of meditation is further introduced that bodhicitta refers to the mind that realizes emptiness. Bodhicitta is that capacity to comprehend the void, shunyata, or the inherent emptiness of existence, of nature. If that Mahayana practitioner persists, they may be introduced into tantrism. And in tantra, the practitioner takes these vows to practice chastity, to never release their sexual forces. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. 
Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.